So a run shard. Now, this, this usually blows people's mind when I tell you this, but a run chart is very different from a line chart. And I'll tell you why, because you have to have a certain amount of observations. They both track things over time and that's what a run chart does. It tracks things over time. It's very simple. You can do a run chart by day, you can do it by month. You've probably seen run charts that track viral suppression over time. You just need to have a minimum of 15 observations over time because that's called a run, hence the name. You also want to make sure that your data collection periods are consistent. I mean, don't have the first period be, you know, two weeks and then the next one be a month and then the next one be a week and, you know, just three days or something like that. It's always got to be consistent. And it's always got to focus in on one thing whether it's viral suppression or um, TB tests, um, whatever it is. Um, so Elaine, I just saw you pop up there. Can you use the checklist with the compared comparison tool to help you prioritize what you're focused on? I'm not sure I understand this. So I'm gonna see if I can find you or Shemay, maybe you could help me. Um, and, oh, okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, bottom line is, Elaine, I'm going to try and find you and see if I can unmute you so we can um, try and answer your question. Of course, this is going to take me forever. Uh, Shamay, if you're, oh, wait, there you are. I'm here. Are we talking about Elaine Carter? Yes. Yes. If you could unmute her, that would be stupendous. Sure. Thank you. So Elaine, can you hear us now? Or oh, okay, maybe that's not working. <clears throat> so it's, it's this is Jane, and I'm not quite sure what the question is asking, but you could use the checklist in conjunction with a priority matrix, right, Kevin? So oh, you yeah. might have a couple of things that come up. Maybe transportation was a problem. Maybe childcare was a problem. Maybe you noticed those two, or maybe you noticed three or four things that were much more prominent than the others in your checklist. You throw them into a priority matrix and that will help you make a decision. But that's, that's another whole session. Yes. Yes, it is. Oh, good. Okay, great. Elaine said that's what she's asking. So nicely done, Jane. Um, so before I move on from run charts, does anyone have any questions? Because this is probably one of the biggest things that we use, um, especially with viral suppression. So I just want to make sure that if anybody has any questions, um, you get to ask them now. Okay, so if type it in in the room, um, in the chat room. I'll move on, but we'll certainly um, address your question if you come up with one. So this is what a typical run chart looks like. <clears throat> and you can see it has some viral information in here, um, viral suppression information in here. And there's some interesting things going on here, right? I mean, you can see that kind of when they started this in April of 2018, they started going down through August. And then all of a sudden in September, it went up to 99%. And I don't know why. And then all of a sudden in October, it went down to 70 again, kind of, you know, strung along 70, 72, dipped to 69, up to 77. Then it started climbing to 84 again. And then it went down to 72 again. So that's a big drop. Then it went back up to 79. That's, that's fairly big. Bottom line is, this is telling me a lot. It's asking, it's making statements that I don't know yet. I don't know why it went up to 99 in one month. I don't know why it went from 64 to 84 and then started going down again. And that's the value in this. Viral suppression is outcomes, right? Well, my outcomes are all over the place. So 
we had the 20 observations, talked about the jump to 99%. In between that November to February period, they were fairly consistent. There's another small spike in May. There's other things that you can see in there. And if I go back to it, does anybody want to tell me what else they see in this? You can type it in the chat room. Would you say it's consistent or it's inconsistent results? You can just type in I or C if you want. Make it easy. Okay. Good. Thanks. Thanks, John. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. The interesting thing here is the answers that you're giving me vary. And that's the best thing about this. Because you all had questions about it. I don't think anybody was overly impressed with the results of this. And Dennis, you're right. It is consistent over time, but inconsistent if you look at short periods. Somewhat seasonable, it could be, Taylor. That's very true. We could be looking at some things called special cause variations in here. We don't know. We can't really make that determination yet because we haven't delved deeper into this data. But these are the kind of things that you come up with, and especially when you're working in a team, quality management committee or a quality improvement team, and you look at charts like this and you say, oh, well, I think we should look at September of 2018 to find out what's going on there. Well, that was a long time ago, but something happened. It may be interesting to see what that was because it may inform decisions moving forward. Um, John says, what happened between 64 and 84? That's what he'd be asking. And that's, yeah, that's a really good question. What did happen there? That's a pretty big jump in a pretty short period of time from February to May in the same year. Something happened. We just don't know what it is. That's, that's, when, we gave out the, that's when we gave out the gift cards. That, that could be it. That could be the whole, <laughs> they had a Memorial Day barbecue or something. But see, this is, these are the kind of things that these tools tell you they also prod you to ask more questions and do a deeper dive. Why do we get to 99? What is the, the jump between 64 to 84? That's 20 percentage points. That's a big jump. If my investments went up 20 points, I'd be on an island in Tahiti somewhere. No, that's not true either. Um, I'd be able to afford another tank of gas for the car nowadays. That's what you want from these things, right? And those are the kind of questions that you ask when you use these tools. And it shows you right in front of your face graphically, something's going on there that just, it looks odd. So some other tools you can use, um, column and bar charts. And you're right, Deborah. something triggered more patients, that could very well be. Very well be. And no, again, that's a perfect question to ask and find out, do a deeper dive and find out what's going on. So if you look at column or bar charts, right, the categories are usually along the x axis and the frequency of occurrence is on the y axis. So here I know that I've broken down the client population by sex. So I have more female clients than I have male clients. Is this good information? Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe, all right. The dog didn't think that was good information, but it is kind of good information. And the reason is because now I know that 
we need to be a little more concerned about the female patients. Am I serving them in the way that they feel most comfortable? That would be the first thing that I, I would, that would pop into my head. After that, I would also ask myself, am I set up to serve the female patients? You know, can, can we do pap smears? Can we do other things that maybe we're not doing or maybe we need to do more of? That's where this is helpful. And these are really helpful, again, as visual aids to help other people understand your data. If you were advocating for pap smear kits and you didn't have this, you'd have a tough time selling this to senior management. But if you put this in front of their face, this tells a story without saying a word. So one of the things we can also do is kind of, if you think about the run chart on the prior slide, um, and then we're gonna look at that period where it jumped from 64 to 84%. So now we know that if I looked at the viral suppression by category, now I know who the guilty party is. Um, not the guilty party, but I know where the problem is and it's in males. I don't know ages. I don't know what's going on with the males, but I do know that only 78% were suppressed. 89% of the women were suppressed. So they probably pull that percentage up over time, right? Um, now this just represents the 84% in May of 2019 that you saw a couple of slides ago. And this is the result of how, they, how the women affected the overall suppression rate. And that was probably going up over time too, more disproportionately higher for women than for men. So now you can also look at your data by stacked uh, column charts. And the nice thing about, uh, oh, wait, let's look, go to Deborah's question first before I go into this. Um, is this how the patient identified at the time of intake? Uh, this changes at times based on how the patient may later. Yes, that's a very good point. It would look much different today, absolutely. And you're right, it does change over time depending upon how the patient identified by gender. I tried to keep these as simple as possible, um, but you're right. I mean, nowadays, especially where people feel more comfortable um, with you know, personal information, it will look different over time. This is just to give you a flavor for how these can be used to drill down into your data, but you're absolutely right, Deborah. Um, so a stack column chart. We basically looked at data like this from our last end disparities collaborative. Um, and you can look at the chart. We looked at retention and viral load suppression. So we looked at two different variables and then we broke it down by ethnic group. And the nice thing about this is that I can see as far as retention um, I had 500 folks retained. I only have about 385 suppressed. So that tells me something right off the bat. Now, is there a direct correlation between retention and viral suppression? No, we're finding that out nowadays. There's not. However, I want to look at this and I want to see what my retention figures look like. So I have 100 black non-Hispanic retained, but only 80 suppressed. I have 200 white non-Hispanic retained, but only 180 suppressed. And then I have 200 Hispanic retained, but only 125 suppressed. So that's, that tells me something. That tells me that I have to do a better job with my Hispanic population in suppression. 
viral suppression. And that's the beauty of these things. The stack column chart is a, is a nice picture. It's a little more complicated than just the, the regular column chart. But the nice thing about it is that you can see in a picture um, what's going on. You've done a deeper dive into your data. And now I know that I need to do something in that particular population. I need to find out more of what's going on. Maybe I need to talk to the Hispanic population. I maybe need to do a survey. I, I don't know, but I'm gonna decide that in my quality management team or my quality improvement team. So again, you analyzed your data. It's now forcing you to ask more questions because you're seeing where there's issues. Now you wanna know why the, the issues exist. Okay, so Kevin, you're stepping on my toes again. How about you take a break? I am? Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay, I, sweetheart. I missed, I missed the purple bar. <laughs> you did a couple a couple slides back, I just realized. Okay, so get a drink of water, take a break, because you're going to finish up. Okay. Um, so um, we've been talking about bar charts, which are very, very simple depictions, and they get a little more informative when we stack them. But as Kevin was talking about way back, we really want to look at data over time. So there's also a way to use those more informative stack bar charts and look at them over time. So this little chart here, what I'm showing you is a closed cohort of 300 patients. That means the clinic chose 300 patients to study and nobody goes, nobody else comes into that cohort, okay? People might leave if they die or move or something, but nobody else comes into that cohort and they look at those same 300 patients over time. So what they did was wanted to see how one of their inter interventions on viral suppression was working and how it was impacting their viral loads. So they chunked out their viral loads into different pieces and they measured these 300 people over time. So looking at this table of numbers doesn't say to me a whole bunch. Now, if if you're someone else, maybe it does, but I need a picture, okay? So um, let's go to the next slide and take a look at what it looks like in a stacked bar chart. Okay, so we see the blue is viral load suppression under 200. And then we have another layer of, of um, viral load measurement being between 200 and 2000, and then another one between 2000 and 10,000, and then that top little yellow one being more than 10,000. <clears> so these were measured um, in January and July over, I guess, 18 months or so, uh, more than that, two and a half years. Um, and they wanted to see how those 300 patients fared over the two and a half years with the interventions they were doing. Okay, so if you just look at the first one in January of 2018, that's our baseline. Okay, we had 179 out of those 300 patients that were virally suppressed, what we consider virally suppressed, and 90 that were not doing so bad. And then we had 17 and 14 that need some more help. Okay, so as we do our intervention, you can see the shift in the colors over time, and it's going in the direction that we want. We want more blue and yes, uh, less yellow. Um, you'll also note that we did lose some people. Um, Again, this doesn't tell us why. Maybe they moved or maybe they they passed on, but we did lose some patients. Um, we also can't necessarily tell out of those 14 in the bright yellow on the top, there's six left. We don't know if those are the patients that we lost and they died or they, they went away somewhere else or if those 14 started to trickle down through the colors, which is what we would want to happen. So this gives us a lot more information. It doesn't tell us again everything, but it is very helpful in uh, looking at this trend over time. So stack bar charts, uh, we have the basic bar chart that you can just tell you a simple demographic. Then we have the stack bar chart, which can break it up into stratified layers. And then we can also use that same thing over time to give us this kind of picture. Okay, Kevin, 
Back to you. Okay, sorry about that, Jane. That's okay. Um, okay, <coughs> excuse me. So histograms, the, um, the histogram is, is interesting for those of you that have seen it. Um, there's a number of different ways that you can present a histogram. Um, some people like to see it so that it kind of mimics a um, standard deviation chart, a bell chart. Um, you don't necessarily need to do it that way, but there are some kind of basic rules for it. You need 50 data points. Um, don't try and do a, a histogram with 10 data points because it's just not going to work. Um, and it's not going to show you what you want to see, because if, if you remember um, looking at a histogram, it's structured by using bins or, or classes, right? So I may say that my first bin is going to be the number of patients in my program that are between the ages of 13 to 24. Well, I can't then say my next bin is going to be from 25 to 30 because those are of unequal size, right? So you need to use the same size. If you're gonna maybe say 13 to 20, that's seven people, then you do 21 to 28 so on and so forth. Um, one of the nice things about Excel is that if you give it a data range and you tell it you want a histogram, um, it will suggest the number of bins. Um, for those of you that want <clears throat> a little more instruction in histograms, um, I alluded to this before, but basically there is a webinar that we did called the Learning Lab and it was specifically on histograms. It is on the target center and it's in the CQII TA webinar section. And I believe it was done a little over a year ago. Um, so the other thing that I'll point out is that there are no gaps in the bars in the histogram. Um, why that is, I have never been able to find the answer as to why that is. But I think basically it just kind of shows you um, or the way it's meant to present the data is the area um, that it, it takes up. <clears throat> um, okay, I'm it. I will have to get back to you on that. Um, basically, if you look at a histogram and it, it takes up an area, it, it kind of looks like a column chart, but it's a little more than that. Um, and you'll see it here, right? So here are the age ranges, they're all the same. Um, you can kind of see the bell curve shape of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, bottom line is that it's very useful when you have large populations and you want to see the, you know, why something is occurring or the effect of something or what have you. Um, if I just look at the number of consumers um, in different age ranges, I mean, this tells me something, obviously. This really tells me that I need to make sure that I am programming correctly for the individuals that I'm trying to serve. Because let's face it, the issues that face 18 to 23-year-olds are different than the issues that face 48 to 53-year-olds. And that's an important thing. Um, thank you, Shimei. Shimei just put in uh, where the webinar actually is on the Target Center. So there was a question, um, is there a way to draw the confidence intervals on, a, on the points in this chart? Um, so Amit, maybe you can just type in the, the um, chat room what chart you're talking about. Oh, sure. So 50 data points. Um, so let's say in this case, um, Diana, I have well over 50 clients, right? Let's say I have 300 clients. That's a data point when you think about it in terms of a histogram, because I'm, I'm counting them as a data point. Um, if I wanted to do a histogram of 
viral suppression, I would set up bins, let's say for under 200 and then 201 to 399 or something like that. Um, and then I'll put how many people fall within those categories. That's an observation. So it's the number of people within a category or the number of things within a category. That's an observation. It's also called the data point. Um, does that explain it? I hope. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. I'm glad, Diane. So I'm at basically um, the, I'm trying to refer back to your original question. Okay. The confidence intervals. intervals. So there is a way to put what I think you're calling confidence intervals on the run chart. So what you do is you basically put in standard deviations from the mean and then anything that falls outside plus three standard deviations or minus three standard deviations indicates that there's a, um, a special cause variation in it. So the confidence intervals are used kind of to narrow down what kind of variations you have, as well as showing you how far away from the mean things are. So yeah, you can do that. Again, it's called a control chart. Um, I have a template for it and it's fine. I hope that explains it. Oh, and if you'd like the um, template for that, I can, I can send it to you. Just make sure that we have your email address. So <clears throat> in summary, there are a lot of data analysis tools. We only scratched the surface of what's available. There are literally hundreds of data analysis tools. Um, the resource slide has some pretty good resources. One that I loved when I saw it was called the Memory Jogger. It's now called the Memory Jogger 2. But it's a little pocket-sized book and literally it'll fit in a lab coat kind of design. Um, but it goes through I think about 25 or 30 different tools. It will tell you why you would use them, what the parameters for using them are, um, what they look like when they're implemented. It has both process and outcome kind of tools. Um, and it's a really good reference that you can just kind of tuck in your desk drawer and carry to meetings with you and stuff like that. And um, it guarantees you're gonna be the smartest person in the room when you bring this out. Um, there's other, <clears throat> excuse me, other information you'll see in the resource slide too, but um, the one thing that you always need to be mindful of is the kind of tool that you choose needs to be guided by the type of data you have or what you want to look at. Um, again, you wouldn't use a process a flow chart to look at viral suppression. You might want to look at you know, intake flow or whatever but there's just certain things that don't apply. So it's important to have some idea of when to apply these things and with what kind of data you would use to apply them. Um, so this is what we know so far. So this is kind of setting up the, the next class, right? Um, we know that we've analyzed the data and, okay, um, we've analyzed the data You've identified something that you want to improve. You might have selected a subpopulation to focus. Um, you maybe have decided on a process that you feel needs improving, whether it's the flow of you know, clients um, or your intake process. Let's say how you reevaluate and recertify your ADAP clients. Okay, that's, that's fine. That's really a good improvement project to do. So that's where we are so far. Data, area to be improved, and maybe a deeper dive into the data so you've really focused down on what or who needs to be improved. So next week, we're gonna talk about structuring your improvement project.
what I always encourage people to do is if, if you can somehow get a data set, whether it's suppression or whatever, look at it. Use some of these tools that we talked about. Use a column chart. If you can only get age data, that's good. Practice these things because they'll be helpful. Um, you know, one of the things that people had great interest in probably about 18 months ago at this point is when we talked about variation and the use of control charts. Um, that was a very well attended webinar because folks wanted to know about variation and how that affects things. It's a very interesting topic. There's a lot of great information about it, but you need to put it to use and you need to practice these things. You know, nowadays we have great tools, we have Excel, we have all kinds of things that will um, help us analyze our data. And another place you can go, I believe I put it on here, yeah, um, is ASQ.org, right? They're, they not only have the seven tools of process improvement, um, it's actually quality improvement, um, but they have other tools as well. And they have some templates that are really very helpful. There's a tutorial that um, we did a long time ago called Making Graphs in Excel. I believe it was made with Excel 2007 in mind and it's still very useful for Excel 2010, um, but it's a little outdated though for um, newer versions of Excel, but still the basics are there. Um, so that's another resource you can use. So at this point, <clears throat> I will open, oops, we're not taking a quiz today, sorry. Um, I will open it up for questions. And you can type your questions in the chat room and we'll start that way. So feel free. Jane gets very upset when, when people don't ask questions, by the way, so we don't wanna get Jane upset. <laughs> I just don't want people to be shy. That's all. There's no reason to be shy. We're not shy folks here at CQII. Yeah, no, we're we're really not. Um, oh, Shimei, could you put up the poll now too? I keep forgetting about this and I apologize. Um, but we just have three questions, three simple questions we'd like you to answer so that you can um, rate the training. Um, we take this information very seriously. We like your feedback. We want to know what you think. And um, believe it or not, we use this data to, to make changes. Um, Jane and I talk a lot. Julia Schluter, who's not here, <clears throat> but normally is on the call also. Um, you know, we put our heads together and we figured ways to improve what we do. Um, it's important to us. So thank you for doing that. But and while you're doing the poll or you're watching the poll, um, please ask us questions because that's why we're here. And just as an aside, hopefully you all know that um, CQII still offers technical assistance on quality management and quality improvement. And you can file to do that through the Target Center website on the CQII page. Um, and also, if you think of something at the end or tomorrow morning when you're having breakfast or something and you, you know, kick yourself and say, oh, why didn't I ask this? Um, basically, send me an email, ask the question, send me an email, and we will um, certainly get back to you with an answer. So Mara, I have I use Excel almost exclusively simply because um, we don't spend a lot of money on some of the more sophisticated stuff that's out there. So um, if if you want some more information or pointers on Excel, um, email me and we can set up a call and I can go through some things with you and also send you some um, some information. Um, 
And Lilia, hi, how are you? And yes, I can do a training on the disparities calculator um, in the future. Maybe I can do that in November. Um, for those of you that don't know, we had a, um, a full blown collaborative. Oh God, I'm trying to, I think it started in 2012, but we had a disparities calculator and the collaborative was meant to address disparities. Um, the calculator was put together so that you could just put in your data. Um, it breaks it down by different populations and you can, it'll calculate whether you have a disparity between that population and your overall client uh, population. So let's move up one to Stephen's question. Is yeah, there a difference I'm between just, reviewing and analyzing the data as a recipient's office versus an individual provider? So are you talking about a recipient and sub-recipients or like a, a C recipient with different uh, doctors in the same clinic? And it probably doesn't really matter, but it's often uh, very good I think sometimes when uh, you compare, like if you're talking about a subrecipient, and um, it's it's sometimes very helpful to compare the results of the different subrecipients or in the same clinic, maybe the different providers. Um, it's good to compare the whole clinic to that individual provider and the whole clinic to the other individual provider. Sometimes. Um, it works as a little nudge, like, you know, these four providers have their patients at 88% and you're at 72, what's happening? And I don't mean it to be demeaning, but sometimes it can help you channel where some efforts might have to go. There might be a problem there with that one uh, provider or with that one subrecipient that maybe could learn from the other providers or subrecipients that are in 88%. So I'm not sure if that's what you were referring to or Kevin, you can address it in a different way. No, I think that's fine. Um, so Stacy, I'm thinking actually before the ECHO Collaborative all the way back to 2012 when it was called the InCare campaign. Um, we started using the disparities calculator then so Rajiv, um, you can use a Pareto or Fishbone for process data and outcome data, although Pareto's can be used for either one. And I'm desperately trying to hold on to your question here. Um, Fishbones are really used for process because they break down the process in a different way. Um, right. Pareto, you can use either way. And then Elaine, is there a so that's a tough question, Elaine. And Elaine's question was, um, when doing a quality project, is there a recommendation as to how many tools should be used? Don't go tool happy. Don't. Right. Yeah, go ahead, Jane. Right. And I would think that it depends upon what part of the quality improvement project you're in. Like if you use a PDSA cycle, there might be a different tool for each part of that cycle. Um, so it depends upon what, you, what you're trying to learn, but you're right. You don't want to go tool happy. You don't want to use a tool because you have it and it's fun. Like yeah. you don't want to use a force field just because yeah. uh, this is a great way to bring people together and I love it. So <laughs> you know, just make sure there's, there's a reason, but uh, yeah, I don't think we have a specific recommendation on a no. number. It just should be applicable to what you're trying to yeah. show. Yeah. And I, I think you want to just make sure that you focus in on the tool that's going to be the most effective um, tool to use for whatever data set you have. Uh, so Stacy, um, Stacy asked, are there any pre-recorded training specific about data that can be used for a teaching opportunity? There's a few that, that I had done. One is the histogram thing. They're very specific though. So if you're, um, Let's look at it this way. If you have something in mind, email me and I will send you a resource. If you're just thinking in general, then email me and we'll talk through it and see what you need. And maybe it's time that we start doing things like that. Um, so Stefan, that's a very good point. Um, and Myra said, I know there are several charts when looking at data that Excel can create. I have used Pivot tables, which are kind of my kryptonite. Um, histogram or run charts can be done in Excel also. 
And if you like, again, send me an email and I will um, send you the resources that we have done. So Taylor asked, that's a really good question. Um, any suggestions on tools that are easier to read so that you can cater the data, data to your audience? Um, I think some of the ones that we went through today, like a, a, a run chart are fairly easy. Pie charts are fairly easy. Simple um, bar chart. Yeah, exactly. Or even a stack column chart, depending upon the number of variables in your data. But <clears throat> again, it really depends on who your audience is um, and what you're trying to get across. The way that I always explain this internally within Department of Health is that you, you want to make something that kind of leaves little doubt in the audience's mind what you're trying to say and that makes it an impression on them quickly. You want it to be, you know, like when somebody comes up to you and just grabs your face and shakes you a little bit and say, do you, do you see what I mean? That's the effect that you want. So that's where the art of this comes in is picking out what that looks like. Um, I would say a pie chart. A lot of people are very familiar with pie charts because you see them all over the place. One of the things you need to stay away from in pie charts though is, is not using too many variables because exactly. then you have slices of pie that you can't even see. Mm -hmm. um, I know that's not a real good answer to your question, but um, I tried to expand on it besides saying it depends. <clears throat> But, but you're looking you're looking for an easier to read so that yeah. would be the very simple bar chart once you start to stack them it gets harder you know yep. and yep. the run chart or the line chart is really pretty easy you could see if the line is going from the bottom left to the top right that that's probably a good thing yep. you know when you start to put the controls on it and you make a control chart out of that run chart then it gets a little harder to read yeah so yeah and again like kevin said the pie chart you know maybe four slices, but it, when you get to, to more than that, it starts to get messy and, yeah. and it does get to be harder to read. Yeah, it's unreadable. Um, another thing about a control chart is one of the things they're very good at showing is special cause variations. The problem is though, that the one I mentioned, the one that sits outside the, the third standard deviation um, that's easy to see, right? It sits above or below a line, but <clears throat> there's five rules for diagnosing standard deviate, uh, special cause variation within a control chart. And just by looking at it, unless you know what these rules are, you're not going to see it. So that might not be the best thing to use for an audience of kind of QI naive people, because they're not going to see it unless you point it out to them and they're still not going to see it because the problem is that the statistical rules that you can apply to look at variation in a control chart, um, the first question people usually ask is, well, why is that? Um, and they, they don't really like the answer. Well, that's the way that it's evolved over time and that's what statisticians have found. And it, it turns out to be useful over time and true over time. Um, <clears throat> people always don't see it that way. So again, that's the kind of the thinking and the art of this. And there's no matter what tool you pick, there's usually rules that come with it for what data um, that you can use and how to display it easily. And if it gets the message across that you want to get across. Uh, oh, I can share the results. There you go. <clears throat> Oh, you're welcome, Taylor. So there's the um, polling results. Thank you all for doing that. We had a, a lot of people answer. Um, are there any other questions? And again, don't think that this is your only shot at asking questions. Um, you can send questions to me after you think about it. And uh, between Jane and I, we can, we can get you an answer. Okay, well, if there's no other questions right now. Ah, okay. 
so <clears throat> I'm thinking, Raji, you, you're either talking about, you have qualified data here. I'm thinking that you're either talking about um, quantified data or qualitative data. Um, so qualitative data, if you think about satisfaction data, um, you could use that in a, in a column chart. Um, oh, okay, that's good, I'm glad. Um, <clears throat> so quantitative data is numerical, right? Um, so you have a lot more options in showing numerical data, depending upon what it is. I mean, we talked about a, a line chart or a run chart um, that lends itself well to kinds of numerical data. Um, qualitative data, like customer satisfaction or things like that, you could do in a column chart, you could do in a pie chart, um, to keeping the you know, number of data points down. Um, qualitative qualitative data you could also uh, so use um, like a word cloud you know yeah that's good that's a good word point. clouds or you could have those the word trees with the different yeah. problems hanging off them and you know yeah. which is the low hanging fruit this is the easy one to fit yeah. so you so you can um, when you get that qualitative data if you group those answers like if if one is saying they the cab doesn't come on time. They don't like to take the cab. And the other one says the yeah. bus stop is too far away. So you might log them into transportation and hang that apple on the tree over there. So you can use a word cloud. I think we had a word cloud in here in the beginning, didn't we, Kevin? We and did, we, yeah, we yeah, did. So um, you might go back to that, but you can put that kind of stuff in there that kind of just shows this, you know, just read the words in the cloud. These are These are the concerns that we have. I think it was way in the beginning. Yeah, it was. There it is. You know, so, you know, this this is one on data, but if you ask them on transportation, you might get, you know, and it might just be an opening or an icebreaker to put those ideas in a word cloud. Or, or you can, like I said, hang them from a apple tree too, if you have these concepts that you want to just demonstrate. So sometimes it's not going to be a chart or a graph, you know. It could be something a little more creative. Exactly. Uh, a focus group here. So I'm just looking at what Stefan here. Uh, if a focus group reports transportation is a challenge, then how does that translate in the utilization in the transportation services and clinical outcomes? So that probably goes to your point about the quantitative and qualitative data. Um, so why, why you're going to have to ask first, use your five whys. Why is transportation a problem? Because yeah. there's lots of different reasons. It could be that the bus stop is just too far. I don't want to walk that far in the rain. It could mm. be that the, the cab picks me up an hour late. So there could be all different reasons why transportation mm. um, is a problem. Or maybe they just don't have the money to pay for it. And maybe your response to that is, okay, we will contract with Uber Health and we'll direct bill so you don't have to pay for it. So you got to find out really why transportation is a problem and then figure out what, you know, what the solutions are to them. And it might, they may be spread out all over, but if you're finding that the transportation problem is similar amongst a lot of people, then you attack that one problem. Yeah. So then the, the, the follow to that is it'll affect the clinical outcome because they're still not Mm -hmm. getting the kind of help that they need, right? They're maybe not getting their blood drawn or the, or the prescriber refuses to prescribe more ARV unless they come in and get their blood drawn, um, things like that. So that's how it kind of links to a clinical outcome. So huh, in the five wise considered process data, Elaine asks, um, not necessarily, but usually it's it's better for that. It's a it's a lean technique, really, that um, we've kind of adapted simply because it's a nice thing to incorporate when you're doing a fishbone diagram, which is process, right? Um, but <clears throat> if you want to look at your outcome data and say why, like if you reflect back to the um, the chart that we showed you before the run chart 
and I'm trying to pull this up without making everybody seasick. Um, but if you look at this, so I could then go to September of 2018 and say, well, why did it go up to 99%? Um, and then maybe the answer is, well, we didn't have a lot of people that came in to get tested. And the only ones that did come in are very suppressed. Well, why did only the suppressed ones come in? Well, it was a slow month. Um, it was a slow month. So why was it a slow month? Well, every September we found that people, for whatever reason, whether it's vacations or whatever, uh, we don't get a lot of clients that come in. So you, you could use it for that too. I mean, it, it's generic enough to do that. You just have to be careful. Anyone else? Okay, well, once again, thanks everybody for um, coming and bearing with us and filling out our survey. Um, really appreciate it. It's very useful um, information for us. Again, if you think of a question after the um, webinar, email me and Jane and I will get you an answer. Uh, we will send out the slides to everyone along with the disparity calculator and maybe in November we'll do a special session on the disparities calculator so you can uh, see what that's all about. So thank you everybody. And I hope you have a very safe week and we will talk to you next week.